Hello everyone and welcome to this Tortoise Thinking. My name is James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And there are a few questions that feel as though they dog our political lives, our working lives and our actual lives. And although productivity is a wonderfully ugly word, it speaks to the essential question of whether or not we're getting out as much as we're putting in. Is our economy, is our economic and political system, and is our working life rewarding us, rewarding us in terms of equality, rewarding us in terms of prosperity? And the reason that we are hosting this thinking, and it's part of a series of thinkings that we want to host at Tortoise is that it feels as though post-Brexit, post-pandemic, we are asking ourselves a question of the 2020s, which is what is Britain's next economic model? And zeroing in on the extent to which the amount of hours we work, the amount of capital we put into our working lives is not necessarily delivering quite the growth in terms of economic outputs that we are hoping for feels like a good place to start, feels like it gets to the crux of the question. Um, for those of you who've not been to a Tortoise Thinking before, our model is that we're a slow newsroom, hence the name Tortoise, but we're also an open one. We want to make sure that we hear from as many people as possible. So in the course of the next hour, I hope that anyone who's got a view on the next Britain's next economic model will weigh in. I'll try to bring you into the conversation. Um, we're very lucky that we're joined by Judith Blake, Baroness Blake, the former leader of Leeds Council, Victor Jang, who runs Huawei uh, here in the UK, uh, Andrew Carter, who runs the Centre uh, for Cities. Very good to see you, Andrew. Uh, and I also wanted to say that the way we work is we hope at Tortoise we're incredibly open about all that we do, welcoming people in. You'll see that we've partnered Huawei in this thinking. I know there's a good deal of debate about the UK-China relationship on a political level. If you read Tortoise, we have strong views uh, about what we're seeing in Xinjiang, what we've seen in Hong Kong, what we've seen uh, um, in China itself. But we're also strong believers in an engagement with China, an engagement with Chinese businesses. You can see from today's uh, economic numbers, the extent to which the UK as a whole is deeply engaged with China. And so having Huawei as a partner in this feels like an important exercise, both in terms of making that point, but also in understanding the way in which technology is going to deliver for China, for the UK's economy and for that China-UK economic relationship. So I just wanted to say thank you and, uh, uh, and, uh, and welcome uh, that partnership with Huawei too. I suppose I start with a really uh, open question. I wanted to come to Baroness Blake, Judith Blake first, if I might, because there is a question about whether or not governments really need to have a plan for the economy, whether the economy itself is just going to do what it does. And in the end, what you see from politicians is rhetoric about economic plans, but nothing that meaningfully translates from those speeches into change on the ground. Do you believe, Judith, that there is the capacity for us to rethink the way our economy works so that we see a different kind of distribution and a different level of prosperity? Um, thank you, James, and thank you for the introduction. Um, and just to, to really go straight to your question, um, I think the what I what I'm what I'm really valuing now is that there is a recognition that we have a major problem, particularly in England, and that the, the debates, whilst they might be inconclusive in terms of how we move forward, particularly, as you say, post-COVID, post-Brexit, um, incredible challenges, at least the debate is being had. And um, there are so many issues that we have to um, bring into the debate. So when I was leader of Leeds City Council, obviously one of the architects of, of moving forward to West Yorkshire devolution deal, oh, we, we had a very heavy focus on devolution and recognizing that um, just um, how centralized England is. And even where we have our devolved nations, we don't have devolution in the truest sense of, of the word in terms of giving uh, over the ability 
um, for local areas to have fiscal control of everything that happens in their area. So really a recognition of the spatial inequality and that is reflected through in our health <coughs> inequalities, skills, um, um, performance, educational attain attainment. One of the most topical issues that I've had to deal with is, is around connectivity, around transport, um, but I think what we've managed to do um, through the work we've been doing is to put um, people at the heart of this debate. So it isn't just talking about um, the economy as some remote entity over there. It's about how people interact with um, their local circumstances and what it means um, for them. And I think what we're seeing in areas where we have low productivity, we, a real reveal of the structural weaknesses in the economy. And I really do believe that it should be um, central to central and local government thinking and that, that there is a real um, purpose for government to, um, to be involved because so much of what we're dealing with at the moment is actually failure of um, social policy, economic policy, and so many people are suffering as a result. And if we're not careful, we'll end up going back to um, where we were before the shock to the system and, um, and end up again with not addressing the issues of low skills in our workforce, poorly paid jobs, um, real um, issues around in-work poverty. Um, and how do we then come together to make sure that we can bring prosperity to all of our citizens and their localities? So some very challenging things for those of us, and, and I'm sure Andrew will agree, um, who have spent a lot of the last years debating um, city regions and city policies and mayors um, and a recognition coming through that, that it's, it's actually so complex, the relationships between cities and their regions, their towns, smaller towns, the rural economy. But can, I, um, but, can, you know, you, can I just ask you one thing, forgive me. Sorry, yeah, oh, no, no, carry on. The, the, reason, the reason I'm interested is, you know, one of the other organizations we've worked with is the CBI. Right? Mm -hmm. So I was at the CBI annual conference at the end of last year when the then relatively new Labour Party leader, Keir Starmer came. Yeah. And I remember standing there watching him speak, talk about skills. And you just mentioned this problem of low skills. And I found myself thinking, why is it that I've heard this issue in the UK for so long? Why is it that skills, I'm sure we'll hear from Victor in a moment about technology and infrastructure, but just to your people point, why is it that skills is proving such a stubborn problem in the UK? Um, I think it's because we don't actually uh, function at a local level. So, um, you know, I had this light bulb moment when I went to visit um, Germany when I had the education portfolio in Leeds. And I asked, if, uh, we were in Berlin, and I asked a German politician how their education policies interacted with the national um, equivalents of the Department for Education. And he looked at me as if he didn't, they could not compute and it's because they don't have the equivalent of the national education department and i think it's um that there, there has been this um terrible tendency which i'm afraid is getting worse that we can run educational programs and prepare local areas for the future needs of the economy from whitehall um and i'm afraid it just doesn't work and where we've where we've had um, city growth deals and the ability to work at a local level, working with young people, working with education providers and businesses together, we've had far more success, but I'm afraid we've gone backwards in that space, in my view. There hasn't been enough focus on further education. We've had too much focus on, if that's possible, but the, the focus has always been, and the measurement of success of kids coming through school, how schools are judged, is I'm afraid the number of kids who go forward into university are not recognizing the vocational routes and into further education. And I think it's these changes that we, we need to recognize it's not working. It's not working for our businesses. It's you know, not working for the new creative um, technologies that are coming through. And that's where we need to really have a local focus 
um, uh, you know, discuss. <laughs> can you just can you just explain to me because I because I suppose most people, and if it's certainly I personally, came away from last year's lockdown very persuaded, having never really taken, I have to confess, much of a passionate interest in devolution, mm. believing really strongly that actually we'd learned a lesson here. We needed government that was closer to home. And we needed yeah. to think about government that was operating, let's say with a sort of 50 mile rule, that you kind of knew who was in charge at any way, so at the, no further than 50 miles from your front door. But what I can't tell is whether or not local or regional oversight then of an economy and particularly around investment in education is necessarily going to improve outcomes and skills why is it that that that, that being regionally or locally run will see a genuine improvement in skills but, but as i as i was saying it's where you have those local partnerships and real understanding of what's needed what what is coming down the supply chain um, who you know where where the opportunities are, what the provision of courses in a, is in a particular area, um, and all of those issues where we've seen real progress, where we've had um, devolution of resources and powers down to a local level to to establish those relationships. But unfortunately, I listened. You know, I, I sat in for the Queen's speech and I listened very carefully to hear where the next um, step around devolution is coming from this government. And we had talk about the levelling up agenda and no real understanding of where we're going now. And I have a real fear that if we don't learn the lessons um, from other um, countries who have been very successful at moving forward, then I, I really do have concerns about how we're going to move forward. And the levels of different skills that we're, need, we're going to need to go forward are really important. So just basic things like determining at a local level what the entry level requirements are for apprentices, apprenticeships. And then you start to understand why the take up of apprenticeships has gone backwards because the entry levels are not appropriate to particularly young people in the areas or, or people in the work place who want to retrain and businesses are telling us for goodness sake let us determine who we want to bring in and work with mm. and we can do far more work on the ground than mm. just having an arbitrary level set at national by the national government that actually isn't fit for purpose that's i mean Julie, that's a it is a great example because internships and uh, apprenticeships it's hard to think of an example where you find businesses that seem to hold both such a high degree of goodwill and enormous level of frustration at the same time. So it's a really, it's, it's a very good example. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back, but first I should say, if people have views that obviously contradict Judith, who think, well, actually we need to do skills at a national level or uh, even an international level, or people who think that, you know, greater, regional competitiveness is not the answer, please weigh in. Or if you've got examples of how she'd write, you know, do weigh into that conversation too. Uh, I, but I'm gonna to go to Victor Zhang, if I might. Victor, I think you've been here, I don't know, more than a decade, 15 odd years. Have you been in the, how long have you been in the UK? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, well, you have been then, probably like me, involved in this conversation about Britain's next economic model from more than a decade. What, what do you think, looking at it both from a technology point of view, but also with an international perspective, should be the future of the UK economy in the 2020s? Thank you, James. And uh, first of all, uh, very happy to be the partner of the thought thinking today. Thank you. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, yes, so. Uh, you're right, and uh, so we we are discussing about the post-pandemic economic model. So the we, so we should understand what happened uh, last year from last year. You know, the past uh, eighteen months, it, it's a very difficult period for all of us because of the pandemic. And uh, but when we review that past eighteen months. And we, what we learn from that, it's because of the broadband we have in the UK, 
and uh, the business can continue because the employee can work from home to support business. And also the education, the student can have the remote license from home. And also the uh, family and friends can meet up through the uh, Zoom and other uh, video technology. So that's very good. Behind that, actually, it was benefit from the UK's infrastructure built during the past more than 10 years. So that's why I mentioned I was here in 2004 and oversee the whole journey of the UK's broadband development. From the very beginning, uh, we do the ADSL technology for the two map broadband. Now we have the 4G and the 5G uh, to support the 100 meg meg uh, broadband for the success. This is a very exciting thing. We have the new technology. Now we it took uh, more than 10 years actually in the 2G, 3G, and 4G period. UK was in a quite good position regarding the broadband in for infrastructure and also start the 5G from uh, 2018. That's very good uh, uh, progress. And uh, we should understand the digital infrastructure will be playing a more essential role for the economic growth. So just like uh, uh, Boris Blake mentioned, so the centralized situation in the UK, so everything we know, everything you need to go to London, everything you need to go to London. So that's the reality. So if we want to decentralize, for mm -hmm. example, the people for business would like to choose other cities as, as their uh, destination, and the people will have the easier way to communicate. So it's relied on two conditions. The first one is the physical infrastructure, is transportation, and this is very important. And also the digital infrastructure is also very important. And Which, Victor, this, yes. Yeah, Victor, sorry, forgive me for, for interrupting. You know, while you're talking, Andrew Girdwood, who's a member of Trotters, wrote in the chat that 5G could turn the UK's obsession with home ownership into a country with amazing home office connectivity. I, we can all work from everywhere. You know, obviously there's been a big debate about Huawei and its role in the 5G infrastructure, but, but can you just tell us from a, from a UK economic point of view, how will 5G change the structure and the performance of the economy? Uh, thanks. Yes, I, I'm going to talk about the 5G because, you know, uh, we know uh, the 4G, so actually we rely on the 4G for a couple of years. After the first deployment for the 4G, uh, it started in 2011. So it's only 10 years ago. And uh, now we are talking about 5G. The 5G is more advanced than 4G uh, because of the uh, speed. It's uh, much faster than 4G and the capacity. So the 5G will support the uh, connectivity for the you know, Internet of Things. We need more connectivity. And also, the 5G supports the low latency. So that means the real time response that was natural. So the economic development, especially for the next generation of the digital economy, we need to have 5G. So the 5G based on the third party uh, analysis. So the, by the 2025, the 5G, only 5G will bring in more than 100 billion uh, benefits for the UK's GDP. So that's very uh, exciting thing. But on the other hand, the UK was in the good position for starting the 5G. But no UK actually is in the uh, quite uh, modern position is uh, far behind of other countries because of the, uh, the decision harm to make the last year. Okay, I'm, I'm going to in a moment. I'm going to just I want to bring in Judith Smith in a moment about the mix in the uh, in the economy, and I certainly want to go to Fiona O'Connor about this question about skills. Um, just, just one point. I think people want to know, Victor, the the situation, and I should know this. The situation with Huawei and, the, and 5G is that at the moment, 
Huawei has supplied some of the infrastructure for 5G for a period of time, is that right? And then at some point, that infrastructure has to be replaced by other providers. Is that the, is that the settlement that the government and Huawei got to? Uh, yes, you're right. So Huawei was a major supplier for the 3G, 4G uh, yeah. with the uh, UK operator. And we were the uh, first uh, supplier for the 5G as well. So the 5G will, uh, I think, remove the network until 2027. Right. That's your right. And so, okay, right, all right. I think maybe settlement is not exactly the right word, but the under, the, the the deal that the government set. Okay, listen, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back if I might to your point, Victor, in a moment about services and what that high speed broadband does in terms of economics and enterprise. But I I wanted to just bring in Andrew Carter before I come to Judith about what that description of a change that Judith described, Andrew, in terms of local government, you know, and a more flexible approach to skills, combined with what Victor described, you know, in terms of a much faster digital infrastructure, means in terms of the map of the UK. When you look at the cities of the UK, do you think in 2035, we're going to see different concentrations of populations and economic activity? Yes, I think we probably, uh, I think we probably will. I think in some respects, although we're living through a moment of, for many of us, um, remote working, I think many of the activities that will drive, I suppose, high levels of productivity, high levels of uh, wealth, high levels of enterprise over the next decade, they are not overwhelmed, you know, not exclusively, but they are significantly in the service industries. And you know, if you think about where the UK is globally, competitive it is often in service industries in the finance services more broadly defined in our creative and cultural indices in our universities and our education services they you know they are all urban based activities by and large and they benefit quite significantly from being in that so we're in a moment of remote working but over the next 10 years i think interestingly i think there's a there's a challenge for us as to how we make more of our urban areas and particularly our big urban areas places where those kind of activities and those kinds of people can actually come and make their way in the world you know i i would offer this we often kind of forget about this point that you know when you look at the big urban areas big cities outside of london in the uk unlike nearly men, nearly all other advanced economies our big cities tend to underperform the national average rather than overperform Right, they're at collectively they're at about eighty five percent of the national average. In Germany, you know, it's big cities: Frankfurt, Cologne, Berlin. When you collectively look at them, they're at one hundred and ten percent of the national average. They pull up the national average rather than pull it down. So, so that's well, quite well, a well, Andrew, that's, Andrew, sorry, that, that's a massively interesting thing which I've never heard before. So our our cities, when you say underperform, on what metric? So when you, well, you, there are a range of metrics that can use, but when you look at productivity, uh, GD, GDP per capita, GDP per worker, GDP per hour work, it's all telling you roughly the similar story. Our big cities, you know, Greater Manchester, Greater Leeds, that Judith obviously was lead, uh, leader of, Birmingham, et cetera. It's about, you know, all in, that's about 25% of the economy. They all underperform a national average. Whereas if you go to Germany, as I said, their big eight places all overperform or if you go to Japan, their big cities overperform. In Netherlands, they're about just above the national average. So it's a big, big urban question for us in a national context. And my final, sorry, my final point, James, would be, you know, to think about national prosperity in Britain and to not have our big urban areas overperforming is going to be practically impossible. Mm -hmm. so, so can I ask two things about that, Andrew? One yeah. Is there an argument that, as politically unacceptable as this is, that the that Whitehall, the government, should say, and I suppose maybe this was the mayor's agenda, say, we're going to pick six cities, five, eight cities, you choose the number. These are the ones that we're really going to make a success. We're going to try and spread, you know, economic power and productivity and really focus on those cities. Is there, is there a country in the world where that kind of policy has worked? Well, I think, yes, we should probably, we, we probably need to, to get to that. And, and your points right at the beginning, we are talking about 
productivity. So I'm not talking about other things. I'm not talking about public services. I'm not talking about you know happiness and well-being. All of those things matter. They're all slightly different. But when we're thinking about productivity, that's the that's the, the number one question we have to resolve. We have to think very carefully about how we get Leeds and Manchester better. And that's about a, a partnership between you know the national and the local. And that's about as a national government thinking about the suite of investments or the suite of uh, powers that need to be devolved and investments need to be made in these kind of places. And how does that then, is that complemented by localities? And I think we need to be a bit more relaxed about that. I've, I've always felt we've had a, we have a strangely sort of anti-urban sort of element to our sort of national psyche. And we, you know, it goes back to the industrial revolution and the dark satanic mills, I think, in some respects. And so we're never quite comfortable enough in government to say our big cities are really important. They say this in Germany, you know, they recognize that the big cities, you know, drive their regional economies, right? You go to, you know, there's a full appreciation of what Munich does, you know, for that part of Germany. There's a full appreciation of what Cologne and Frankfurt do. But we don't really yet fully grip and, and grapple with the appreciation of what Leeds does for the West Yorkshire economy or what Manchester does for the Northwest economy. And we're going to need to get there. At least I, I would suggest we need to get there. And I think that's one of the big differences that we hopefully will see over the next 10 years. I think we've seen governments edge towards this slowly over the last decade, decade and a half, maybe. And, and, is there, and Andrew, is the what you're describing the lower productivity or lower output in big cities I'm assuming you're not including London in that. No. So if you London is is the you know the par ex you know it, it it's miles ahead in terms of the national average. So yes, if you look at the the next eight biggest, which would be Manchester and Birmingham and Bristol and others, yeah. So, so can I just combine that? On the one side of the ledger, you've got London way overperforming on productivity, but what, what many people would consider be to be falling living standards given housing and general cost of living. Yes. In those other big cities you're describing, underperforming on productivity, but do those cities also have high housing costs, um, high costs of living, and as a result, stagnating or falling living standards? So what are living standards in, the other, in those other big cities? Yeah, it's a kind of relative sense. You're right, in a sense. And, and this is why wonks like me worry about, you know, um, about measurement and what you're what you're actually talking about. Once you control for housing cost in London, then the differential between London and elsewhere obviously drops for obvious reasons. Yeah. It's a very expensive place. Little, although we can deal with that by building more housing in London, but that's again a political issue that we probably want to park for now. So, but there is so there is a differential. You know, housing is marginally more costly in parts of Manchester uh, or parts of Leeds, you know, than some of the surrounding areas. But the differentials are not quite as large. But, but in a sense, well, what we're trying to do is reduce the costs uh, so of living there or doing business there, whilst also maintaining and, and enhancing the kind of innovation side of the economy. And those two things, you can do both of those things at the same time. Okay, Andrew, that's so, it's so interesting. By the way, you won't have seen, but my colleague Ellen Halliday um, put in what passes for her, and I should say for me, and probably for people that taught us generally as, as a fun fact, that Germany is the only country in Europe where the capital, Berlin, decreases the GDP per capita. Amazing, amazing things you learn. Um, listen, I want to bring Judith Smith. Judith, I, I see you've made many points, but actually, if I, if I can, I'll tell you what, what I uh, was interested in, was the point that you made right, um, uh, right at the beginning, which was about manufacturing versus serv services. And I, and I should just, well, well tell me what you, tell me sort of what drives that thinking. <laughs> I suppose um, it's that business of um, flippantly, we don't make anything in this country anymore. And um, so do we, um, how much do we rely on manufacturing? And also, well, generally we're supplying other countries. Uh, that's the manufacturing that we're doing because we don't have much ownership of things for ourselves. Um, but, um, we have had an economy dominated with the service industries. I mean, it's quite interesting what Andrew was saying about cities um, and centres. Unfortunately, I've lived 
too long, I think, because in the 80s, you know, we were shutting down all the specialist industries that we had in this country and de-skilled people overnight. And eventually, within the next decade, there was an attempt to try and replace those skilled people with in other industries, call centers, the beginning of digital, I suppose. And um, some areas it was successful. I mean, I was working in the Sheffield region at the time, which was supported by the EU. And um, companies were coming and going overnight. It was just ridiculous. Um, you know, telecoms con uh, companies and so on. People didn't, there was no skill development. Employers weren't investing in people. And, um, and so now we've got centres in the north in particular that were specialised centres in the past and we haven't really replaced them, I don't think. I think we've, we've undermined a lot of people and their jobs and communities. So it's about what have we built up over the last 20 years, say, um, to replace those things. And I, and I don't think we've done it enough. We can't rely on retail. And if one thing this pandemic has shown us is how, you know, uh, it's just, there's nothing there in retail, is there? You know, it's uh, everything is, uh, you know, hired, the buildings are hired, the people are hired, and they can be sacked overnight. And, uh, and, and, whole towns have gone dead as a result of our reliance on retail that has now gone online and you know our roads are full of lorries as a result and it's so frustrating let, let, let me true this but it's really interesting because actually as it happens i was on a call with someone in the government earlier today who was talking about their economic model for the uk and saying it's value-added manufacturing and services which is another way of saying everything. Right? What, what does that actually mean? Uh, and I just wanted to bring in Simon Thought, if I can. I don't know whether Simon, you're near a, you. either a camera or a um, microphone. Are you there, Simon? I am. Hello, hello. So, so uh, I'm just interested because your point in the chat was, look, that there is a world of next generation value added manufacturing that, that we should be focused on. So t t tell me your thinking about this. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm rather, um, I, I rather suspect that a lot of the measurements we use are, are wrong. Um, so the GDP measurements, I mean, whether GDP is the right measurement, uh, we can debate. I think some people have been debating it in the chat channel. Um, but I, I, I have a feeling that many of the services that we offer are not really classified very effectively in terms of our productivity. So I have, a, I have a sneaking suspicion that our productivity is nowhere near as bad as it currently looks in the statistics. And I think that's partly because we measure our economy slightly differently from some of the European countries. But other people on this call may know much more about that than me. The, the, the other thing I think is really interesting comment about the cities, because a lot of people in the north in Manchester, where I do a lot of work, say, say to me, well, Manchester's number two city in the UK. And I say, well, why is that relevant? Because London's a financial center, Manchester's completely different. And you need to look at, I think somebody made a point earlier, you need to look at each of these cities and say, what defines them? What are they really good at? Yes. And how are, we gonna, how are we gonna build on that? Because there's no point in trying to pretend that these cities are the same, they're not. So, uh, so it's, it's interesting actually, we did had one of these conversations with Andy Street, you know, from Birmingham. And he's very good at this. He's like, we're going to, we're going to build gigafactories. We're going to, we're into batteries and the electrification of cars. You know, and someone like me, who is simple, <laughs> likes it because it's simple. But, but I wonder whether or not actually that's a simplistic way of making policy in terms of economic planning. Because in the end, you know, governments can't necessarily point at Leeds and say, we'd like you to manufacture X and point to another city, I don't know, Newcastle and say, we'd like you. I, I don't know, Simon, what your, I, I see Andrew's got his, has got a point to make, but Simon, I don't know what your view is on that. Well, I think we need targeted investment in technologies that are going to, that are relevant. So that is a technology that's clearly relevant. And there's a huge amount of work that can be done to create battery infrastructure, electronic vehicle, electric vehicles that we're all going to need. And we're going to be fast going to need because otherwise we won't be able to meet zero emissions so there's great opportunities and I, I, I think there's a huge opportunity around uh, the broadband and 5G infrastructure because these these are tools that make us all enormously more productive 
Now, again, whether they're actually measured in statistics properly, I don't know. People on this call may know better than I. But well, so anyway. I'm, when it comes to that, there's someone who's there's someone who looks like they really do know what they're talking about here in the chat. Adam One, I'm going to come to you. I don't know what your surname is, Adam, but I'm going to come to you in a moment. But Andrew, you had a point about, you know, government planning and targeted investment. Yeah, no, I think I think that I, I think the point was 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 very well made by by Simon, and it is a sort of tendency for for you know for governments to try and and pick bits of the, the economy up and move them around and think that they can they they can do that, and I think it's understandable that I think we just need to be a, a little bit um, cautious of that. You know, my my observation uh, I say this, you know, Nissan came to Sunderland many many years ago. It's a super productive uh, plant. Um, but let like Sunderland is still one of the poorest sort of places in you know in the the northeast and the northeast is one of the poorest regions. Yes, Sunderland would be worse. I'm not denying that at all. But but the idea that these you know these even these biggish investments cascade out without you know without us thinking carefully about that is is my my, my other observation. I think picking up was it Judith's point on on what what happens. I mean we have a an abysmal if I can use that word an abysmal track record of coping with and dealing with economic change. Essentially, we, you know, in the 80s, when the mines and the manufacturing went, for whatever reason, we just abandoned places and kind of left people on income support, you know, and they never worked again, you know, and the worry is that we'll, you know, we'll do that. You know, think of, I think these numbers are right. I think, you know, if you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, they're spending around 1% of GDP on lifelong learning. Right mm. and flexible working through your life, adult life. We don't spend anywhere near that. We're probably spending ten pence, you know, in, in comparison. So, and that's that's not just about an institutional issue. Or I think that really does um, matter. That's about you know a cultural appreciation of lifelong learning and what that really means, which is a bigger a bigger question and a bigger issue um, for us. But whatever the change that is, whether it's net zero, whether it's Brexit, whether it's technology helping people and places adapt and respond and cope with that change. We've just got to be much more serious about that. And I, I would argue, you know, we've not really been serious about that for, you know, for 30 years, probably ever, but certainly not for 30 years. And we're going to need to get serious because the next 10 years, next 15 years, an awful lot of stuff is going to change. Can, can we, Andrew, thank you. Can, can we, I'd like to just spend five minutes digging into two particular issues that have come up so we can feel as though we make some progress with them. The first one is the one that Judith Blake raised, among other points, around you know greater regional authority, but was around skills. And Fiona, uh, Fanola O'Connor, Fanola, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong, but you've actually um, made this serious set of points about skills, and also touched on this lifelong learning point. Are you there? Can I bring in Fanula? Well, she may be so yeah i am um i don't know what's happened to my video um but like I, I can't see you and also I, I can't say your name right so shall we try let's, go, let's start with that how do you say it okay it's fanula fanula okay good yeah. I, I Much easier than it in one sentence so i might as well land something so so to, just just you picked up on the point that judith made right at the beginning which was around skills and i'm interested to know what you think can practically be done to make sure that we change the outcomes there yeah I, th I think it's it's really just kind of being realistic and, and being local as as Judith said because you know whether you're working in a care home or you're I don't know building neural networks what you need to do your work well to be fully productive and innovative is you've got to have some kind of expert knowledge you've got to be able to solve problems and follow procedures and those sort of meta skills and you've got to be able to get on with people human skills and when you actually look at work and productive work and differences between the best and the rest it's really clear that what the best are doing in any job is they're combining those hard skills soft skills and those kind of problem solving skills and when i look at say fe colleges yeah. that's what they're teaching in their courses when i look at universities they're only teaching the expert skills and some of the thinking skills um, and I think that's something that you know I hear time and time again from employers. And actually fixing it is not rocket science, but it does mean we've got to kind of give up on our fantasies about what education is, about what skills are. You but, know, but, look to can I, can I be I know it's I know it's sort of unfashionable actually then to find yourself 
parroting the government line on this. And, and least of all, I can't believe I'm doing this sort of Sajid Javid, right? But he would say, and as a conservative, he'd say, you know, I've been part of a party that's for years been focused on university education and now bangs the drum for FE, for further education in colleges and for investment in that part of the education sector. Is it possible that actually the quote unquote leveling up agenda is also forcing all our politicians, I'm not making a party political point here, actually to, to reconsider where education, where, where we need to put our pounds in education, where we need to make our investment? Yeah, I just don't think that's real right now. I hear a lot of talk and I see very little action and even less money. OK, fair enough. But the, but, but the, the change of mindset is happening, isn't it? I think it's I, I'm not sure. I think it's happening. I, I too often when I hear people talking about joined up skills, they're talking about low level jobs. They're right. not talking about the jobs that I think a lot of people sitting here on this call have. It's all of us. We're all in it together. I think we should be, you know. Thanks. I, I'm just on that skills point. I just wanted to ask Baroness Blake back in for a moment. Judith, the, 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 well, one person made a, a, a separate comment and Andrew just touched on it, which is the lifelong learning point. So you, you made a point earlier on about apprenticeships and access. T take your example of how you get greater lifelong learning if we move to a system of greater regional authority. Well, we, we've been um, trying to do this in um, Leeds in the wider region for some time. So when we get advanced warning, for example, that um, a particular industry or sector is going to um, have some difficulties. It's about getting in there in a timely way and working with with a, with people within the workforce. And I think we need to really hammer home the fact that the skills agenda is uh, does follow people right through their um, work experience. There has been, and quite rightly, a lot of emphasis on young people, but this is about working through. But I think there's another element that we're missing in terms of leveling up. And I think it's one of the things that the pandemic has exposed so cruelly is how women have been disproportionately affected, first of all, by the downturn in the economy after the crash, but through the pandemic. And when you actually start looking at the jobs that women tend to have, the, the, the lack of um, control of businesses at board level, um, and uh, all of these areas, if we can focus on these areas as well, um, I think we could really move towards something much more inspirational and transformational. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the problem is, you know, you have a situation where we talk about West Yorkshire. Um, it's no um, secret that I actually favoured devolution to Yorkshire. And what we ended up with because of government legislation that we had to divide the functioning economic area of, of Leeds City Region because it didn't fit with the artificial boundaries that governments had put into the legislation. So um, our functioning economic area spreads out to Harrogate in particular, yeah. incredible interchange um, between the two, which mm -hmm. probably speaks volumes about um, where we need to address the problems because there, there is this saying, if you live in Harrogate, you don't work there. And if you work in Harrogate, you can't afford to live there. And there's massive population exchange and our, the functioning economic area stretched out to York. But yeah. we were forced if we to get a devolution deal, we had to go back to um, a West Yorkshire model. And it's just things like this that are so frustrating with the work that we've done for decades. But I think there are particular areas we need to be far more sophisticated about understanding what is actually happening in our localities. And I'll just go back to the point that I think getting, gaining and being able to do something about what we learn from that is far better managed at a local level. And I'm afraid if you actually um, look at the announcements around um, the lifelong learning prospectus that the government has just put out, the restrictions on that in who is going to be eligible is, is, is just so depressing and it needs to be much better informed by people who understand on the ground what the barriers are and addressing those barriers. So childcare costs, for example, we've talked about transport. It's not just about the physical 
transport infrastructure, which is woeful in parts of the country, but it's affordability and people can't afford, you know, young kids who could access opportunities, but they're restricted because they can't afford to get to where they could, you know, go to thrive and get the qualifications that they need. Judith, thanks. I'll come back to you in a moment. I wanted to, as I said, sort of spend five minutes thinking about the, the skills element of this and how that might work. But I also wanted to go deeper on the element that we kicked off with too, which was connectivity and the relationship with productivity. And there are, there are a couple of points, Victor, before I come back to you, I just think it's worth hearing. Um, Kate Manners, you, you've made a point here about connectivity and, and, and access. Are you there, Kate? Yes, you are. Yeah. Hello there. Is, is your point about, is your point about the Andrew Girdwood point about sort of home offices or is it about agricultural economy? What, what was, forgive well, me. Well, it's a sort of, it's a sort of combination of both really. Um, agricultural land covers 72% of the UK and yet contributes less than 1% to GDP. And our productivity levels are woefully low in agriculture in comparison to our biggest competitors like the Netherlands. Um, now the loss of BPS is going to have a sort of further impact on, on farmers. And one of the BPS, BPS? Uh, um, basic payment scheme, it's, it's CAP, basically the EU subsidy regime where farmers get paid for just occupying the land. It's not to do with anything they produce. It's just a it's a subsidy, basically. Um, and that accounts for a huge proportion for the majority of farms that makes up the majority of their income. And that is being cut um, by 50 percent by 2024 um and of course combine that with the low productivity and now this loss of their subsidy um sort of farmers are facing a sort of a sort of earthquake really um defra equate productivity in agriculture with age their current aim is to get old farmers out and younger farmers in however there's a lot of work to say that actually it's to do with skills and formal training and again in comparison to our competitors levels of formal training in agriculture are very, very low. Only 16% of farm managers have um, further education. Um, and this is where the issue of connectivity comes into play because you can't offer workshops, professional development um, schemes. If farmers cannot access internet or they don't have 5G, they don't have phone signal. Um, and it is one of the biggest things that holds back, not just agriculture, but the rural economy in general um, is sort of digital poverty. So it's sort of kind of where the issues um, sort of intersect. So, so, so I, I mean, we've got then the, we've got the rural question. And then we also obviously have the question that Andrew raised about cities. There, there's a point Paul, ha Paul Harrison made, which I just want to make sure that I understand. Um, Paul's written here, that the government's ambition now is nationwide 4G, so we'll fall from a relative position of strength in terms of early adoption of 5G. I don't know whether Paul, you're on the line. Can you just explain to me? I don't know whether that is. Is that what do you mean by that in terms of the government's ambition is nationwide 4G? Well, uh, hi, hi everybody. Um, look, I mean, I think it's 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 a question of of ambition. If we if we're talking about uh, bouncing out of the uh, economic slump caused by COVID, uh, you know, as Victor uh, alluded to at the top of this, uh, of this thinking, you know, connectivity is going to be vital in making sure that, that we can, uh, you know, increase our productivity, we can do it efficiently, we can do it quickly. Um, and what we sort of have seen over recent sort of months and probably over the past year, is a, uh, not just the decision over Huawei and the decision to, to to, to uh, you know, pause that or exclude Huawei from the 5G rollout uh, from the January this month, uh, from, from January this year. But the general kind of move away from uh, uh, 5G being, uh, uh, you know, an urgent thing that we have to introduce quickly, that we maintain our, our position as a leader in, you know, in Europe uh, and in the world for the 5G rollout. And have moved away from that to having an ambition of of kind of nationwide, you know, rollout of four G, uh, which is which is all very good and 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 you know, uh, um, you know, um, uh, you know is 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 definitely worth pursuing. But actually, it it sort of slightly falls short of ambitions of other countries that are already marching ahead fast with five G, and it's the early adopters of five G who will realise the benefits much more quickly. 
and, and Paul, I, I, I know you, you you speak from a far away point of view, but can I just understand something? If you if you were working in another sector or another telecoms business, comms business, would they be saying the same thing? Are they also thinking the government is slowing its commitment to the rollout of 5G? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think so. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, and specifically with the um, uh, decision over Huawei, uh, the Secretary of State, Oliver Dowden, made it very clear that the 5G rollout would be delayed by two to three years, which... Oh, um, so, which, which, which yeah. So, yeah. so your, your, point, your point is that that choice means a delay? Yes. Okay, all right. Let, let me, but before, before um, we go on, Victor, can I, can I ask you a different question? Right, which is not about 5G, but is about a point that um, uh, Ralph Graham Lee made, which is about the lag between technology investment and productivity. Because one of the issues here is that when someone like you says, we must have more technology, we must have more technology infrastructure, is a lot of people say, well, we've had the biggest investment in technology infrastructure in our lifetimes in the last 20 years. And actually we've seen productivity more or less flat, lose, certainly lose its growth. So why should we think that the next generation of technology, the next generation of digital connectivity is gonna increase productivity? Well, good question, Dan. Mm. So, I, uh, first of all, I would like to echo uh, Paul's point uh, and also Barney's uh, play mentioned the, uh, the broadband industry. So actually, we have some numbers to do. So in the UK, so now we are talking about 5G, we are talking about the new technologies. The reality in the UK, so the broadband, fiber broadband coverage is about 12%. Twelve. Twelve. We include twelve. One, two. What twelve? Okay. Twelve percent. Actually, is far, far behind with other uh, developed countries like uh, Japan, one hundred percent, and even Spain is eighty percent of the current. So this example, the UK actually is the the fiber broadband coverage is far behind this one, and also the. So the speed of the UK, the average speed of UK product is uh, about the 22 to 23 meg. The performance is also lower than other UK countries. Com compared with uh, uh, like Germany, it's nearly 40%, uh, 40 meg. So actually Germany is not good, uh, not best one. The best one is still in, in, in Asia, in Japan, in Singapore, uh, uh, actually 100 meg. So, that's a good example. It's still a long way to go for achieving the average broadband for everyone in the UK. This is a very big bottleneck for supporting our education, for business, and for everything we want. That's that's, that's one I just anchored to Paul. Yes, James. I'm Victor, sorry. I just want to. Sorry. So, so that's really interesting. UK's relative underperformance on connectivity. But even so, that doesn't explain the UK's underperformance on productivity. How do you explain that? Uh, probably I need to correct your statement about the productivity of the UK. So, you know, the international report, actually, you can search from UK government website. The UK's productive ranking the 31 within the 35 OECD country. It's a very low between 2008 and 2017. It's not, so UK was very good productivity before 2008. So okay. Where is less technology involved into our economy? So at that time, and the between 2008 and 2017, UK actually is quite a very low productivity group, especially uh, for recent years. This already reflects uh, how important, not just technology, but also the R&D investment, innovation, have already been the key factor to drive the economy. 
Okay, Victor, thank you. But um, just before we end, I want to see if I can bring in Peter Sugarman. Just Peter Sugarman is very nice to see in the electronic chat. I e I I even more used to prefer it, Peter, when I'd see you in the um, uh, in our newsroom because there'd be a moment where you'd nod like this. I think, oh no, I've got this wrong. Uh, and now I can see that digitally. So your your point is that the technology investment. Just explain to me your point about technology spend and and uh, about wealth and technology spend. Well, I think we tend to be too parochial. We we look at the position just in the UK and we beat our breasts. And in fact, what has happened over the last 30 years is there's been an enormous increase in global wealth, but a relative decline in the positions of the UK and indeed other uh, G7 countries relative to uh, the Far East in particular. But that's still, but isn't Peter, that's different from the productivity puzzle, isn't it? That's, that doesn't, that, that can be true and still not explain why we can't seem to increase our outputs given our inputs. Let me uh, ponder on that and come back to you. <laughs> okay, well, we will, well, well uh, I'm, Andrew, I'm going to come to you in one second. But just to say, the, the reason for this conversation is that if you, if you think about great newsrooms, I think of a place like The Economist, it started out uh, in 1843 with a view which was about free trade and it more or less drove a successful economic worldview for 150 years. The difficulty it now has is that that free trade argument is challenged both in terms of prosperity but more significantly in terms of equality and so we our question as a new newsroom is to say how do you figure out an economic worldview how do you think, starting with the UK, where we're based, what should be the next economic model? So the good news, Peter, is that this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end, uh, end of an hour. But given that it is just coming up 7.30, I'm going to invite Andrew Carter, who had a quick comment to make. I'm going to go to Judith and Victor for a final thought and then wrap things up. Andrew. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very, uh, very quick. I mean, I think there's lots of evidence that um, tech diffusion into the, into the British firm base is particularly weak. Right. So the, the technology exists, it's just not taken up. Yeah. This, and this relates to my second point. So we're focusing on the supply of the tech. And obviously that is very important, however you describe it. But actually, when you look at the, the data, it's questions about demand. 50% of, of the poorest households don't access the internet, even though the internet clearly is there for them. Mm -hmm. That's not a digital divide, that's an income divide. Yes. They are too poor to access a service that is on their doorstep. And actually, my point there in relation to access, supply and demand applies to physical connectivity on our transport system as much as it does on our digital connectivity. We focus on providing more trains because we think that really matters. But actually, you've got to think about the cost and the reason to use it, which is all on the demand side, not on the supply side. Once you get rep beyond very, very basic and low levels of provision. Andrew, thank you. Judith, final thought from you. Um, just um, thank you for inviting me on the call and I, I can't possibly do justice to the richness of the conversation but I think in terms of your next outing perhaps we need to focus a bit more on what people actually want and what their reflections of their experience from yeah. the last year has taught them because what we're hearing um, is you know decisions that people want to re reduce the day number of days that they work they certainly want to keep the flexibility in terms of whether they can work from home and work in the office, but probably both. Um, and I don't think we really fully understand the impact of what's happened on, on people's psyche and what it is that they want to achieve. And unless we get that right, then how on earth can we tailor programs to make sure that we're successful going forward? Julie, thank you very much indeed. And Victor, what's your last thought on this? Thank you, James. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell everyone that because the uh, uh, digital infrastructure is so important, especially today we have very good uh, discussion uh, because of the uh, Pacific uh, internet. So far, we will be here to support this uh, with, together with our partners and our patients. So finally, I would like to say the post-Brexit, especially post-pandemic, so the working model 
will be different from before. So the new normal will be hybrid. So we should have more digital demand in the post pandemic period. So we need to focus on more investment into the infrastructure, digital infrastructure, and also to encourage the more investment in the ACS area. And this will be uh, accelerate the innovation and good for the future development. Victor, thank you. I, I, I have to say, I did something rather foolish at the start of this hour, which is I decided to take notes on one of these big pads. And I've been scribbling notes for the hour because if you're like me, you grew up in a newsroom like the Financial Times. There was a kind of simple way, not a simple way, but a clear way at least of seeing the world. And I suppose I've spent my life getting older thinking, well, I'm not so sure. And I ended up writing not a a great or even coherent answer to the question of the productivity crisis and how the UK makes its way in the world. But I did write two notes that I think we'll pursue as we think about things. The first is on Judith Blake's point and uh, a point that was picked up by many others, uh, not least Andrew, is regional competitiveness. It feels to me as though this is something that, that Germany, for example, understood for a long time. And we used to look in sort of uh, uh, wonder at the Mittelstand and the idea of places in Germany that had economies of their own. We now look on that with some jealousy and regional competitiveness and therefore the devolution of economic power, the devolution of educational power to a much local, lo a closer level feels to me like a really big and important idea and something we should explore further. And then the other note I wrote was human infrastructure. So how do you combine the talk of skills, the idea of having access to the internet, so the connectivity and the pace and the, uh, the, the physical digital infrastructure with the point that Andrew was just making there about the actual access to it, the, the, the access in terms of the demand side of things. And so how we think about human infrastructure, how we think about regional competitiveness, and then take that to what we are taught to think are the sort of three business challenges of the next 30 years how humans do business with silicon, how humans do business with DNA, and how humans do business with CO2. And if we can somehow bring those uh, two ideas, regional competence and human infrastructure, we might be at least at the beginnings of something. Um, thank you uh, to everyone who's joined us and spared the hour. We really appreciate it. Tomorrow, we're gonna be talking, of course, um, uh, ironically enough, all by Zoom, all remotely on the future of work. Uh, so there's, we may have already answered the question before we already begun, but we have a summit tomorrow for the whole day on the future of work. Please do uh, join us. It won't just be around remote working and hybrid working. It will be around what work means to us. And to your point, Judith, what we've learned about how we want to live our lives, uh, you know, in the light of the year we've just had. Uh, but for this evening, a big thank you to Victor Jang, to Andrew Carter, to Judith Blake, and to all of you who joined us. Have a very good evening.